Okay. The following interview was conducted uh, for the Purdue University uh, Oral History Program with um, Nancy Cross, Senior Associate Athletic Director. It took place on Monday, uh, Jan June the 9th, 2008, and Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Sure. I was born in Walpole, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston, about 20 miles south of the city. And uh, I have an older sister and a younger brother. And um, my dad's an engineer, so he knew about Purdue long ago. And my mom's a nurse. And I uh, grew up in a, in a family that really valued education, uh, valued the athletic experience in terms of how it taught you to be a team member and that competition was healthy and all of that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. What was our school like? Did you go to school close by where you were living or, or growing up? Uh, I did not. Um, I went to school, college in Ashland, at Ashland College, which is now Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio, and felt very strongly that getting outside New England was going to be a positive experience because nobody in our environment uh, encouraged that. Our guidance counselors thought with New England, the Ivy League schools and the private schools and the state schools, nobody ever had to leave. And because my dad traveled all over the world, we kind of had a, a more global approach, and I felt that I could always go back to New England, sure. but to, to only have that experience I didn't think was, was as positive as it could be. Yeah. Tell us a little bit. In high school, did you go to high school? And where you growing up? Yeah, Walpole High School like? was fantastic. Uh, about 400 students in my graduating class. Uh, we actually because of uh, rapid growth they had to um, we had to have a split session my junior and senior year and then we went to an open campus and I felt that that really helped me prepare for college because if you weren't in class there was you didn't have to be any place else so there was really no accountability so you had to learn to to use that time to go to the library and be productive especially if you were an athlete because you had to be there early if you were an upperclassman but you then had to stay late because you had practice sessions so you had to, to really be disciplined and, and learn how to use your time wisely. What athletics did you participate in? I was a field hockey, basketball, and lacrosse player. Okay. Way the team did pretty well? Teams did fantastically. And, 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 and in New England, um, intercollegiate or interscholastic sports for girls started pretty early. So we started competing in junior high school. And so by the time you got to the high school level, it was pretty much old hat. But our teams did very, very well. Really? State championships. Good. Kinds of fun Tell things. us a little bit more about college and what athletics and your student a activities and I was in classrooms involved. in the campus. And it was a very um, small school. Uh, I selected it for a variety of reasons. One was it allowed me to get a liberal arts education, but I would also end up with a teaching degree. Uh, the other options were back in New England and the liberal arts schools, you graduated but you didn't have a teaching certificate and my dad was very much as an engineer a pragmatist and he was like if you're gonna if, if we're gonna do this you're gonna have something <laughs> to show for it because I knew I wanted to teach. Sure. So um, Ashland kind of surfaced as a very positive um, environment because its athletics program for women even back in the early 70s was very strong. Uh, it had um, a, a small environment which I, which I wanted and it also had lots of um, liberal arts options as well as a teaching option. So it kind of met all the criteria that I had established. Good. What athletics did you participate in? Same three, field hockey, basketball, and lacrosse. Okay. And but now where do you, uh, the competition where there's some uh, playoffs and things? There were. Um, it was Back then it wasn't NCAA. It was um, AIAW for women. And so you organized it by state and then region and then national. So it was okay. a little different than than just Division One, Two, and Three as it is today. Okay. And you did for the teams that did pretty well. Which one our, did you, our did you have a favorite? Our basketball teams actually did incredibly well. They competed for national championships at the small college division. So that was a really that was that really sounds very fun. good. Okay. And then um, I mean, graduate graduate education was here at Purdue. It wasn't was it? here at Purdue. I had an opportunity for several assistantships in universities back on the East Coast but they made me choose between teaching and coaching and because I came right from undergraduate school I wanted to have both experiences because I felt that whatever path I took at that point um, was going to really dictate my career and I wanted to have as broad a based option as possible so Purdue allowed me to get an assistantship in uh, physical education in the teaching part of it and then um, the women's athletics program was just starting. It was only a couple of years old uh, in terms of its interscholastic, intercollegiate status. And so the 
basketball and field hockey coach at that time said, if you can get an assistantship someplace else on campus, we would love to have you volunteer. So I was able to come to Purdue and get both teaching and coaching, which, which I thought was going to help my resume. Sure. What, what was your career path after you graduated from college? You came straight here? To I Bruce? came straight here. Okay. And uh, that was August of 77. And then actually went back to Ashland to teach for one year and then came back to Purdue to start a PhD program. But with coaching and recruiting and being on the road with two sports, um, I never, I never finished that, that unfortunately. Busy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about a little bit about your time at Purdue. Sure. Yeah, and your when your position and your challenges and opportunities and responsibilities. I started um, as a grad student, and then actually when I came back to Purdue after my one year uh, moratorium or hiatus back at Ashland, uh, I came back to as I said to start a PhD program. So I was a grad student in both field hockey and basketball. So at that point, the athletics program for women had at least begun to offer assistantships specifically um, in in each sport. Uh, our coaching staffs were still part-time, uh, but they were allowing them to have an assistant if the assistant was a graduate student. So we combined two assistantships so that I could actually um, I could actually continue the PhD process. And, and so I was an assistant coach for a number of years in, in both sports, and then I became the head coach of our women's field hockey team while I maintained the assistant coach status in women's basketball. And then in um, 1984, they, the administration made the decision that they were going to make women's basketball a revenue sport. And at that point, because of Title IX, they had made women's volleyball a revenue sport, but not women's basketball. And everybody else in the country had prioritized women's basketball. So it was putting our program further and further behind because of how we had to compete. So uh, they made the decision that they would make women's basketball um, a varsity or a, a revenue sport, which meant full coaching staff, full scholarships, um, full complement of travel, you know, everything that, that they needed to compete at the highest level. So I had to make a decision whether I wanted to be a full, the full-time assistant in women's basketball or, or maintain the, the head coaching position in field hockey. And you know, I, I must admit, being able to run your own program and recruit your own kids and do all of that was, um, was pretty exciting to me. And I, I just adored the student athletes that I recruited to Purdue. So I thought that it, depending on what else they p partnered that with, that, that that would be, you know, that I would stay with field hockey. So when I asked um, all of the Olympic sport coaches, as we were called, had additional responsibilities. And for instance, our wrestling coach did video, and our baseball coach did football parking. And so I was really curious what they were going to, you know, partner my position with. And they said, "Oh, we're going to have you do all the public relations and promotions for the women's sports." And I'm thinking, "Can I have video?" <laughs> and they, you know, they all laughed and said, "No, we think this would be great." And and because I had been involved with basketball, I thought this would be a great way to stay involved, but at a different level, and try to help market it and brand it and, and get people to come to the games. So I maintained the uh, head field hockey position through 1987, and then they dropped the program. And I still um, continued with promotions and then moved into development, and then from development to you name it. Uh, tell us a little bit about when recruiting for students for the field hockey and, high, and coaches and things, and some of the things that are involved, so researchers get a little bit of a sure. feel. Sure. It, it was actually a... And it an changed over time when it, you It did. It changed drastically, really from um, AIW days when uh, we could not pay for a student athlete to come to campus, but we could put them through a tryout. Um, my, Did you have to go there? Or we had could, to go and watch them, oh. or they could pay their own way here. So then, all of a sudden, you were um, only able to attract, especially in the mid, you know in the Midwest. Most of the field hockey was either on the East Coast or the sure. or the West Coast. Although we did have kind of an oasis in St. Louis. Um, so we would, you know, we were already just attracting kids from private schools who could afford to come out for an audition and. And I remember that one of the first field hockey scholarships, I think, was you know three hundred dollars, and we thought that was absolutely incredible. And and the young lady who accepted the scholarship thought that was you know that that was unbelievable. And now it's you know full ride and everything, including books. And I mean, it's a it's it's pretty incredible how much it's grown. But we had such a limited budget that I um, really spent a lot of my summer going around the country and doing Olympic developmental field hockey camps because it would allow me to have access to kind sure. of the best students and the, the you could kind of put them through your own battery of tests to see how competitive they were and how they interacted with 
you know, other teammates. And so that was a, a really good way to get a broad base um, from which to, to then recruit the kids. What about the coaches that uh, you had? Did you, was that to draw them from the Midwest? or? Um, actually, most of our um, assistant coaches in field hockey were grad assistants. Okay. So we had a turnover every couple of years. And um, a lot of them were, were student athletes from other Big Ten institutions or other programs um, against which we competed. Uh, some I actually had a, um, a a young woman from England who was on the um, all England team, but she had worked in our Olympic developmental program and had gotten to know a lot of our student athletes. And so when we had an opportunity to um, to bring her over as a grad assistant, she you know she thought that was pretty exceptional. Sure. One of the things I was going to ask you about you were the one of the for that field hockey to Pan Am Games. Yes. Yes. Tell us a little bit about how sure. that came about. That was uh, kind of an interesting It year. was very interesting. In 1987, uh, we, uh, Indianapolis hosted the Pan American Games. So a couple years prior to that, they were trying to find people who would be responsible for each of those sports in terms of the commissioner to make sure all the, the games were held correctly and the venues were appropriate and practice times were scheduled. Well, in the state of Indiana, there very weren't, weren't very many people who had any kind of expertise or pseudo expertise, as I called it, in, in the area. So I happened to have coached a young woman in Indianapolis. Um, she actually went to Arizona State, but um, she was in one of my Olympic developmental um, camps. And then she had come to watch several of our Purdue games. And so she was involved uh, and, and basically said to the or local organizing committee, well, the coach at Purdue would, you know, would, would be great. So it wasn't like I had to out-compete everybody for the position. It was like an N of one. And they said, well, you know, you, you're about the only one in the state that knows anything about this sport. So And you're close. Doc, and you're, yeah, and you're close. And you have a whole, you know, you have access to lots of people who also know the sport. So Dr. Beering, who was president at the time, really encouraged us to do a lot of outreach and give back to the community. And so when we approached him about whether he would, you know, endorse this or not, you know, he was open arm. Absolutely, that's where a nucleus of our alums are, and you know, our fan base is Indianapolis, so we need to have a presence. And so it ended up that you know I started doing that and had just a phenomenal experience. Did you uh, did, were you involved in getting any of the athletes or anything of that? No, part? all of the the teams were selected by their rep, their own countries, but okay. um, we were just involved with the whole execution of the. The, the tournament, so oh, it was pretty and fun. You were back and forth through a lot of traveling. I remember oh, reading an article about that. Traveling back and uh, the number of hours were, were incredible. But what was really fascinating was the game is played um, on AstroTurf at the, at the elite level. And so the only AstroTurf fields that we had were the Colts practice field at that time and also the the field inside the, the, the Hoosier Dome, the RCA Dome. And so Monsanto said that if you take it out of the, the actual um, dome, at that point it's tied down. And in, uh, in field hockey, to, to reduce the resistance, you water the turf so it gets a truer spin. And they're saying if you water that turf, and then try to put it back in, it, there's shrinkage. And all we kept thinking is, oh my gosh, if we ended up doing this, and then they try to put it back for the first football game, you know, that the Colts are playing, and, and it doesn't fit anymore, where, you know, I'm gonna get the first, uh, the first plane out of town. So it ended up that we moved into two of the, um, the, the demonstration halls, like convention hall B and C or whatever it was. In the building. In the building. Yeah. We actually had the games inside. And of course, the athletes thought this was spectacular because it was air conditioned. <laughs> and they thought they died and gone to heaven because in August in Indianapolis, they're like, wow. But all their practice was at the um, was outside. So when they got a chance to play inside, it was pretty It was much better. That's your idea. Tell us a little bit more about that, uh, the, athletic, the uh, marketing and things that you did. What, had there not been uh, much done before that? And there, there had been some. I, I actually um, moved into the position because Sally Combs um, was one of our first, uh, when, when women's athletics became uh, a legitimate entity, uh, and George King hired an athletic director, a women's athletic director, and a woman who would handle all the public relations and promotions. And Sally Combs was married to our team physician, Bill Combs, at that time. and. And so when she retired, they were looking for somebody who would kind of move into that position. And so that was what I did. And the, the whole intent was to try to 
at least encourage people to you know come in and and watch the watch the women so we did a lot of things with very little money and we just tried to outwork everybody and we had we really only tried to promote two sports at that point it was volleyball and, and women's basketball and so we did some really fun fun things on basically lots of leg work and lots of volunteers but not a tremendous budget that, and you got people from the community you went out and did some things we did we did a lot of outreach and 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 if you need volunteers and and you ask people who know something about either volleyball or basketball and then they're willing to do it then they take real ownership in you know growing the 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 fan base from you know 50 to 100 to 1000 to sure. 5000 and so we did some fun things and i remember in 1980 i think it was 84 we did pac mac and basically back then there was a video game with a like a little almost a little ball it was called Pac-Man and it would you know eat away at things and it looked like to us a volleyball with a little mouth so we kind of you know built on that from a creative standpoint and moved into Mackey Arena and most of their games at that point you know were in the IAF and not very well attended and so we tried to set the record because at that point Western Michigan, who had hosted an NCAA event, held the record and Purdue's volleyball program was so much stronger than that and we thought that, that Purdue should hold the record. So we sent out letters to alumni and we promoted it all with, as I said, hardly any budget at all. I think all of our budget was, was spent on mailing and we really challenged people that even if you didn't like volleyball, you had to come in and, and at least support because Purdue should hold the record. So it was more of a Purdue pride thing than a Purdue volleyball thing. And so back then, we didn't have bands, we didn't have Purdue P, we didn't have cheerleaders. So we, we knew that if we could get people to come one time, and it was as much like a men's event as possible, then they could, you know, they could relate to it. So we had the band and we had cheerleaders and we had Purdue Pete, which was all very novel to a women's athletic event. And we, you know, had balloons and tried to make it as festive as possible. And then a lot of times when a student athlete is very efficient at their sport or her sport, you make it look so easy that anybody thinks they could do it. So we asked our baseball coach at the time, who was Dave Alexander, if we could borrow his his um, speed gun when he used to use it for measuring the speed of a, of a pitch. And what we wanted to do was take, we had a student athlete by the name of Marianne Smith. Marianne was um, uh, incredibly skilled, was an All-American, was selected to represent the U.S. and Japan. And she was a phenomenal player. And so we thought if, if Marianne could spike the ball and we could time her, her the speed of her, of her hit, we would, we would challenge some of the local fraternity guys to see if they could do the same. And of course, we asked for volunteers from the audience and got all these guys. And Marianne, I think, hit close to 85 miles an hour. And, and these guys, first of all, couldn't even time the jump. So a lot of times they weren't hitting the ball. And other times when they do, they'd hit it into the net. And then any that were successful, it came out to about 27, 28. And of course, we were doing it with a microphone and telling everybody. But we wanted to, when we did it before the match, so that people would get a real feel for how, even though she makes it look easy, there's a tremendous amount of skill involved. So In the so volleyball. In volleyball. And then we did all kinds of things that night. And we actually did break the record and had over 10,000 people in Mackey for a for a volleyball game and basically we would say okay look to your right look to your left now everybody has to be back here for the Illinois match because you want to break the Big Ten record and so we just did all kinds of fun things and, and it worked out and it worked out great that's great yeah. that's really nice and a little bit about uh, how women's athletics has changed over time and, and some of who've been involved in it so share some of those things uh, uh, selection of coaches and the recruitment and things how those change sure our selection place. of coaches is identical to how we select our, our male coaches. Um, we go through a national search when we have a, a position available and um, they meet with everybody from the president to you know the athletic directors to our faculty athletic representatives because we believe that you know that that every student athlete whether you're a football player or whether you're a men's basketball player or whether you're a golfer you deserve to have people who understand the importance of athletics in an academic environment they need to understand that you know that that we are trying to get a student athlete from point A to point B. It's not just about skill. It's about being able to, you know, to develop as a person, to develop leadership skills, to give back to the community, and all of that. So the selection of the coaches is is pretty important. 
and you know, I give Morgan Burke, our current athletics director, lots of credit. He's had a lot of experience, more experience with hiring women's coaches than than men's coaches right now. But he does, he just does a super job of vetting them and and making sure they're a good fit for, for Purdue because it's. There are lots of people who are qualified, but making sure that they're the right fit for okay. what our core values are is pretty important to All us. Right. What about the student athletes? Has, are you drawing, has it changed over time? They're coming not only from the Midwest or Indiana, yes. but... Yes. When Morgan arrived, um, he challenged each of our coaches that they were to um, com compete in the top 10 in the big, t or top half of the Big Ten, and within the top 25 nationally. Well, at that point, because of restricted um, budgets, most of the coaches were trying to recruit specifically from Indiana and the Midwest. And that's great because we believe that as a state school, that's where our focus should sure. be. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to perform at the national level, you can't always assume that, that every year Indiana is going to produce the, the absolute best in your sport. So Morgan made sure that the coaches had access to in-state and out-of-state full rides if that's what they needed. So while our coaches understand that the Purdue's mission is, you know, land grant and, and we're here in, in Indiana, we look here first, uh, but then we look Midwest because we seem to think that they understand, again, our core values um, better than some of the kids either internationally or or um, around the nation. But But anybody that that we think is a good fit for us is is fair game. Right, that's a, and it's it's a challenge. They, and they now they can make visits and, and now that's they all can. Ch the the NCAA we're all under NCAA rules before we were split, where the men had NCAA rules and the women had AIW rules, and now we're on under the same umbrella, and so we can pay for a student athlete's um, visit to campus, which really helps because if somebody from a is a is from a socioeconomic background that couldn't allow them to to visit. We think that limits their opportunities. Yeah, uh, let me ask you about that. Uh, prior to uh, women getting the NCAA, why don't you clarify that for the researchers, the organization? Sure, the organization. When women's athletics first started, and they they needed a national umbrella. This is after where, Title IX and beyond. This was during right, sure. just during the whole Title IX. You know, so in the early 70s, then um, AIW, which stood for the Association of Intercollegiate Athletics for Women they formed their own governing body. So they came up with the rules, they came up with the championships. They were the ones that basically dictated and managed how intercollegiate athletics for women would be run. And then from the national AIW, then each state had, like Indiana was the IAIAW, the Indiana Association of Intercollegiate, or Ohio was o OAIAW. So Those each states. state had their own. So you competed, even though we were in the Big Ten Conference, we competed with all the other large schools in in the state. So we would, in order to go to a, a regional or a national in basketball, we might compete against Notre Dame and Indiana State and Ball State, even though they weren't in our conference. Then when we got into, um, when the NCAA uh, took over all intercollegiate athletics for both men and women, um, it went to the way the the guys were organized, and so it's all done by by conference. Yeah. Okay. And then you've got you know, some of the you work with the alumni in the Big Ten uh, women's sports, and you work with the you, alumni too as well. Yes. Yeah. The alumni principally is because we want our um, anybody who was a student athlete, you know, we want them to still feel like they're part of our program because they, especially for the women, were such frontier, you know, frontier women back then, and had it not been that they were trailblazers, our current student athletes would not have the opportunities that they have now. And and the other way we work with the alumni is if, for instance, our um, women's golf team just competed at the national championship in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we have a number of alums in that area, and we let them know that the women were going to be there. And so it you know it's it's a good way for us to bring a little bit of Purdue out to wherever wherever the, the and alums the students are. benefit by that too as students well. Students benefit immensely because you know what when they sit and listen, you know we try to in, encourage them to come to a, a dinner or whatever, and and for our young women to hear. You know about their Purdue experience and what it was like, the campus was like sure. then, and what their opportunities were, and more importantly, what they've done with their Purdue degrees. It gives our young women or young men a chance to say, "Wow, the sky's the limit." And it's so, a little bit of mentoring and role model, absolutely. and that kind of all works together. That's it, nice. it does. You were saying earlier, field hockey was dropped. It been? was. Oh. it was dropped in 1987. Okay. Uh, we finished the year second in the conference. Our young women did a phenomenal job um, in the classroom. But we had just uh, hired um, for a football coach, uh, Fred Akers, and 
we had promised, part of that negotiation was that he would have an indoor practice facility. And the indoor practice facility, we would, I think we were the one of two Big Ten schools that didn't, that didn't have one. So he felt, Fred Akers felt, that in order to compete in this conference, he needed to have a similar facility. So back then, the, the, the actual reserve for intercollegiate athletics, um, all intercollegiate athletics, and it continues today, is, is paid for independently. The university doesn't subsidize athletics in any way. So all of our Olympic sports were, um, the budget came from the revenue that was generated from about a $6 million reserve. Well, when the, when the uh, bids came back for the indoor practice facility, it, it, it originally was forecasted as a $3 million building, then it went to six, and then the bids came back at nine. So they, were, they had to use far more of the reserves than, than they had anticipated. So at that point, they went back to the state of Indiana and looked at which sports the state of Indiana supported. And field hockey was in the private schools in Indiana, but not in the public schools. So that was the decision to, to drop that sport. And okay. even though we you know, argued vehemently and pointed out that actually we were generating more revenue, revenue for the university because all our kids were out of state and with the limited scholarships that we were giving them, we, you know, well, we, lost, yeah. we lost that cause. What was the Olympic uh, things you were uh, doing, some training or camping? Or, yes. Tell the, um, us what that the, was about. The way the Olympic teams are selected, it's very grassroots, and so um, anybody who, who has aspirations, you know, is on a high school team or a college team and has aspirations to move to the Olympic level, they start at Olympic developmental camps in the summer. And so you sign up to go to an Olympic developmental camp at the D level. And then if you're selected from the D level, you go to the C level, then the C level to the B, and the B to the A. And that's how they select the national team. So they use a lot of high school and college coaches. And then the better coach you are, they ask you to kind of move, move up. up to. So okay. it gave me access to lots and lots of really talented high school kids. Yeah, that sounds so, good. Now, your, uh, your duties have changed a little bit. What tells us Significantly, up on that. Um, I got into college teaching and coaching to be around 18 to 22 year olds. And now I'm principally doing um, development and sport responsibilities for the department. So uh, I'm responsible, along with my staff, for raising about seven and a half million uh, annually just to pay for our scholarship costs. We have about 500 student athletes, and with um, the escalating tuition fees, room, board, and books that that happen every year, it's uh, it's a, a daunting task. Not, not, nece it, not necessarily women's always. That it's everybody. All yeah, it's every. Okay. We're a combined program, right? And uh, so it's it's no longer. You know, I take care of the women and somebody else takes care of the men. Uh, we feel that it's much more efficient if um, both, like for instance, um, both swimming programs report to the same administrator. So that way, when you're making decisions about budget and about schedule and about the pool and about travel, you know, everybody's being treated sure. very fairly. And Yeah, that sounds good. And then, of course, we talk a little bit, uh, let's talk a little bit about corporate sponsorship. That. Uh, select corporations that fit the Purdue culture, which is kind of key. And that's a change over time. It, it is. It's a significant change. Yeah. And, you know, for a, a, a lot of years, the um, we always said the, the S word. You know, we, we couldn't say the S word, which was sponsorship. And and then when they, when actually when Morgan Burke arrived, he said, if you're going to ask me to be an athletic director, uh, an athletic director of change, um, I've, he benchmarked all the other institutions, and they were, you know, they they had all kinds of corporate sponsorships, and and so while they agreed that we would open the doors a little bit, we were going to be very conservative in terms of the kinds of partnerships that we would um, that, that we would have with with our corporate partners, and so we took a look first of all at um, where. Purdue spent a lot of its money, and you know, AT and T and Singular and you know, Verizon were were three that you know that that popped up, and and then they had pouring rights for the university, which was Coca Cola. So that was a good you know a good partnership, and so we took a look at at the people that Purdue was doing business with first because we felt that they you know they understood and. The administration was far more willing to allow us to have conversations with them than to go out and forge that by ourselves. So. Yeah, and then you've got others now that you have. Don't we you? have, but um, it, and it's still, you know, it's really interesting because while we come can come forward to Morgan with an idea, 
um, he's kind of our first filter. And then if it's something that's pretty far outside the box, then we've always had a relationship with um, our, our vice president and treasurer, and also um, Joe Bennett, who is our um, vice president for university relations. Because Morgan's point is with that triumvirate himself and the other two, that they have a real 30,000 foot level of, you know, what's going to fly with the university and what's not. You know, they, they have been really good, um, a good sounding board. And so far, we've not brought anything up to them that, you know, that, that, they've, that they've said, no, we're really not comfortable. Sure. Usually it doesn't get to that point, like beer or cigarettes or, I mean, and, and we, get, we get flooded with people who want that. They want access to our, you know, to our, to oh, our sure. demographic. They're coming to you. They're coming to us. And so it's been really good to be able to say, you know what, as much as the dollars are nice, that's not who we are and that's not what we want <laughs> to endorse. So. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk a little more around that media and promotion for women's athletics. That's really increased, but, but for all athletics, is increased. Oh, it really it? has. Yeah. Um, and, and our promotions people have done a great job. And, and again, with a staff of, they have a very limited staff, but they use a lot of student interns. So we believe in athletics that any time we can do something that not only helps our student athletes, but that we can partner with the rest of the university to give other students an opportunity. We think it's, you know, we think it's terrific. So, you know, this year with the television, now that we're at the Big Ten Network, I mean, that's been great. Um, the, the, you know, the Jumbotron has given kids in the television sure. um, major some excitement and some experience. Our interns help promote so they understand what it takes to work with a coach and build a budget and come up with creative ideas and then stay within that budget. And then we ask them to measure the success they have. What was the, you know, what was the attendance before? What was the attendance after you did this? And, and come up with, would you do it again? You know, so that we're you know, asking them to really kind of think critically. And when we renovated the golf course, we used students, student help from horticulture and turf management and landscape architecture. And, you know, and Pete Dye, who was the, the, um, the golf course architect, world renowned, who, who helped Purdue kept saying, I don't know about these student helpers. And then when he finished about a week with him, he goes, I've never been pushed so much in my life. So <laughs> we think all of that's really positive. <laughs> it works at the both. It's a win-win it, for it everybody. It does. Well, he was so funny because he said, okay, I'll do this, but I'll tell you what. If some kid comes in a ponytail or has a earring or a tattoo, I'm done. And, of course, the first day there, you know. But by the end, he said, I, you know, I learned an awful <laughs> lot about my stereotypes. And he said, I've been so impressed with this group of students. He'd say, I'd say, okay, we're done for the day. And the kids would go, no, no, we can get four more barrelfuls of pea gravel and, you know, whatever it was. But he, uh, he has a totally different appreciation for the, for the You've student. been away from it for a while, and then he too brought long, it back, and right? And he admitted, too long. <laughs> oh, you were talking about Morgan, but you also served under George King, so there have been two directors that, that, since you've been involved in there. Yes. And each has a different style. I, I would true. say diametrically opposed, yes. yes. George was already on when you George, came. George was, was the athletic director when I came as a grad student, mm -hmm. and then I was hired by him to be the head women's field hockey coach, and... Then I was also told that he had dropped my program, so <laughs> so we had a we had a really good relationship. <laughs> oh. But Morgan, you know, George George was in my mind a very George was here a long time. He was wasn't? here a long time because he was here as the basketball coach. That's right. And so after he finished coaching, he moved into the the athletic director role, and that was pretty typical back then. That if you were a former football coach or a basketball coach, you moved into an AD position. And Morgan was right at the cusp of a different breed where it was the, the business person. And because Morgan um, was a swimmer, he, he wasn't your typical football or basketball player where, you know, got everything handed to him as a student athlete. And so he came in with the philosophy that if we're going to have 500 plus student athletes, each one of them is, is going to get the resources they need to win a national championship. And based on that, you know, he put the pressure on the staff to, you know, to make that happen. But it's, it's been a win-win for, for our student athletes that you come in here and we're going to get you the best coaching. We're going to try to get you the best facilities. We're going to let you compete at the, at the highest level to prepare you for a national championship. But there's an expectation and the expectation is that, that sure. you appreciate it and, and you capitalize on it and that, that you're going to walk out of there with a Purdue degree and some expertise in leadership. 
That's the message. One thing, uh, I think as an outreach for the athletes and uh, changed over time, did, did, as I remember years ago, it didn't seem to be as much within the community, I would say. Yes. And that's a good, that's a good, well, it of course, is, engagement has really taken engagement off. Engagement has right. taken off, but especially in women's athletics, we feel very strongly that the quid pro quo is, wait a minute, you expect and want everybody to come to your games. What are you doing to, you know, to try to meet their needs? And so we think that our young women, especially now with the, uh, the visibility that they get in the paper and on television and on the internet and on the webcasting, that they are role models and that they need to understand that, you know, with a lot of privilege comes responsibility. And so there's an expectation that they give back to the community. And that's another part of their education for the whole Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, John Purdue Club, any comments on that? That's still, you know, that's a big helpful there. <laughs> oh, yes. The, yeah. the John Purdue Club, actually, when I became an Weren't assistant you director. Were involved with that? Or yes. Just, um, yeah. I um, became an assistant director in 1988 because they had dropped the field hockey program, and I had two choices. I could have left, or I could have, uh, or I could take the assistant director position of the, of the um, John Purdue Club. And I was adamant that if I left, I was going to leave only after every single student athlete that I had recruited to Purdue, even though we dropped the program, many of them were going to stay and finish their degree because these were kids in engineering and, you know, math and science and pharmacy. And, and, and at that point, they were too far along in their career. And we had some who had aspirations to play at the Olympic level that transferred. So I accepted the um, position with the John Purdue Club to be the assistant director. And the irony is, our first challenge was to raise enough money for the Mullenkoff Indoor Practice Facility, which was the reason that they dropped the program in the first place. So, but every day we continued to train with the kids who were going to transfer because they cut the program at mid in, in December. Hmm. So then I became involved with um, with our membership, and at that point it was about 4,500 members. And when Morgan arrived, he said you know what, the resources are, aren't what they need to be, so we're going to challenge you to double the size of the club in three years. Well, we doubled it, but it, was, it took a little bit longer than three years, and people were, were fantastic. They, they became our, our best sales, sales force, and they spread the word about what we were trying to do and how we were trying to do it. And, and I can tell you that the John Purdue Club for a long time was all males. Um, you know, it was not open to women and Joanne Price, right? yeah, Joanne Price was one of the first, she was our faculty or a member of our Athletic Affairs Committee and I think she was one of the first women and um, and it was by invitation only years ago and so that reputation still, ma you know, was maintained by a lot of people so they didn't, you know, they didn't realize they could join the club and, you know, the perception is that it's thousands of dollars to be a member and we're sh people were shocked when they realized it was only 200 and and what we try to do is get lots, you know, a really broad base and get lots of people involved. And then it's our job to make sure that their relationship with, with us and with athletics is strong enough and that we're good stewards of their money and we've invested it well in our student athletes that then the next year they might give us 250 or they might go to the $500 level. And, and that's how we pay for not only the scholarships but all of our academic sure. support of our kids and then also every facility. Anything that we build, whether it's the aquatic center or the new tennis facility or whatever is all private contribution. Right. How, how have you, um, what did you make some change? Did you sort of do more recruiting for members? Is that what? We were term? very, we were very aggressive. Um, we added levels. We, we oh, took, we didn't used to have. We used to have three levels, oh. 200, 500, and 1,000, and that was it. And when we, we were, um, actually it was Dick Walbaum who is my mentor and the director of the John Purdue Club, and he said, if we're going to raise money for the Mullenkoff indoor football facility, we can't do it if $1,000 is our top level. So he added the $2,500 level with a, a lot of perks. And then the next year, you know, or a few years later when Morgan came back and said, these are the things that we have to do and we need more money, we recognize that every few years you can't continue to add a level and then try to find perks that are, you know, exciting and appropriate and whatever. So. It to meet that level, to get to, to that. Yeah, to reach that level. So what Dick did, very, you know, every every level is is set at a certain dollar amount. I mean, as a minimum. I mean, obviously people can give more than that if they don't reach the next level. But but Dick said we should have one that's actually a floating, um, you know, that, that's adjusted every year. So we established back in, gosh, it must have been the mid '90s 
that our highest level would be whatever the Board of Trustees determined was an in-state uh, full ride, so tuition, fees, room, board, and books established by the trustees. And it's been really funny because the first year, at that point, our highest level had been 2,500, and then this was like 5,000. And, and people immediately jumped up. They're competitive and they want to be at the highest level. Well, right now, this next year, it'll be close to $17,000. So in less than 10 years, it's, uh, it's escalated pretty high. But that's a good way to, to it, it meets what you're, uh, it, it balances it out. It does. What it, it, does. it does. And it doesn't put pressure on the, you know, on the, on the base, which is what we wanted. So. Right, yeah. Um, do uh, you still participate in the, any alumni uh, activities yourself? I do. Oh. I do. Um, we, as a matter of fact, this week we have a number of alumni golf outings, and so I'm I'm out on that circuit, and you know. You playing golf too? Yeah, and not I don't play well, but yeah, I, I have to be out there. And so I always <laughs> tell them that I'm, I'm the best at donor relations because I never beat a donor. So <laughs> that's why I always get invited back. They're I'll like, be oh. behind you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then you served under a couple of presidents. I think when you first came, was it John Hicks was the actor? Or President Baring was at, there. At, no, actually, when I arrived in '77, it was Hanson. Oh, Hanson. President okay. Hanson. And then you've been here through Hicks uh, and Beering and Hicks again and <laughs> that's right yep. and, and Dr. Gift Jiski and, and now Cordova yeah. Yeah. yeah quite a few like you and I how about a favorite Purdue tradition got one of those I do, actually I have two I, I thought about that based on your um, your preparatory email I love homecoming and I love graduation to me um, homecoming is so neat because. Uh, to have the alums back and they relive the you know the experiences they had and the energy of that weekend and I like it because I get to listen to to the 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 comments made by our student athletes who hear what they're saying and sometimes when you're in the middle of something you can't see the forest for the trees the kids are so bogged down with hours of training and watching video and going to class and writing papers and then leaving on a Thursday and coming back on a Sunday night that they that they're not enjoying sometimes the ride and and when they get to hear the alums talk about this was the best time of their lives and you know and this is where they met their you know their closest friends or their you know their their life partner or whatever it's it's so neat for the kids to go, God, someday, you know, I'm going to be in, in this position. And then graduation to me is so neat because it's, it's not only the, the ending of what they've done here, but at that point they just, they're just so excited because they think that, you know, that the, the world is, is at their hand. Yeah, that's good. How about an outstanding event in your life? You got one of those? I really don't. Um, you know, athletically, I think when the women won the national championship, that was really exciting because I had been in the, you know, back involved when, you know, 20 people came to a game and you walked into Mac Urine and you went, and you went, hey, Catherine, hey, you know, and you knew all the parents and all the roommates. And to, you know, I was thinking that when we did the celebration, because the women won in San Jose, so when we came back and, and presented the trophy to the team in front of all the fans, there were more people at that event than there were probably in, if we had added up every, you know, every game that we had during the, you know, the 70s and early 80s. So for me to watch um, the acceptance and the growth of, of women's athletics has been spectacular. Yeah. Oh. Any questions that I didn't ask or any comments that things that you'd like to ask? I think you've been incredibly <laughs> thorough. <laughs> yeah, any closing comments that, uh, Nancy, you'd like to share for the researchers or anything in general you'd like to say? Well, when I was sharing with my sister, who is also um, a, a Purdue grad, she got her master's degree at the same time I did, and that was a really special experience for us. But she kept saying, wow, I didn't realize you were that old. <laughs> so when you've been at, at a place for 30 years, and, and, and there have been lo lots of other opportunities, but somehow when I always do my, you know, because my dad's an engineer, the spreadsheet of all the pros and cons, nothing measures up. That's right. Good. Thank you, Nancy. Thank Lorraine. you. My this pleasure. Was, this concludes the interview. Thank you very much. Thank you.